anybody in your family is goofy ever or funny uh, or anything like that. Um, but in our family, it's harder to get people to be serious. And so um, uh, anyway, my dad uh, texted me uh, about a week ago. This does have something to do with our, our service today. It's, it's not just something. Um, but um, uh, they love it that Noah is playing the drums. Our, our, if you don't know who Noah is, Noah is our son, and he's playing the drums. And so here's what they texted because they watch on Facebook when they're not here. And so uh, just a quick text. Dear Pastor, we are thinking about sending our tithe to your church. If only we could see the drummer. Do you think arrangements could be made that we could see more of him? We were thinking possibly put the drummer in the center of the stage. That way the drummer could be heard and could be seen. Then they could put the praise team all around him. Seeing how we're good members, we would like that done by this next Sunday. Um, some concerned visitors is how he signed it. Good members that are concerned visitors. Okay, um, so I texted him back. Dear Concerned, we have many requests concerning the visibility of our drummer. To give a short answer, we're working on it. The task is buried under layers of past policy so wide and deep that it's become obvious to me that our church's very existence so far seems to rest on the foundation of keeping all drummers caged and hidden. <laughs> it is a delicate matter. Yet we think the matter of the drummer re-imaging could be expedited by means of several five or six figure donations made at the first of each month for the remainder of 2021. Again, we are working as fast as the current level of donations will allow. Thanks for bringing this matter to my attention. And then my dad texted back, that really sounds like blackmail. What kind of church is this anyway? And I responded back to him, it is the church of the hidden drummer. <laughs> so <laughs> um, that, that will be pertinent later in the, in the message. I just wanted you to know what my family's doing. Uh, sometimes even while I'm up here, I will get texts from my boys and things like that saying, hey, how you doing? Uh, got a minute? You know, that kind of thing. And, and I'll go, my God. My goodness, do they not know what I'm doing? Yes, they know what I'm doing. Um, I seem to have forgotten the clicker. You on up there? Anybody on up there? All right, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll just have to move you forward today, okay? I, I left it. It's right over there, but I guess I could get it. Okay, somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Um, they're already practicing spiritual rest up there. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, no, they are on the ball and they do a fantastic job, but it's it's hard to know what somebody's thinking up here. OK, and so um, we, we've been in the series. You rule now for a long time. This is the 12th week that we've been on it. and We've had some breaks in, in between here and there and uh, some fantastic stuff. But uh, uh, things shift a little bit where we're at. We're almost at the halfway point next week. We'll be at the halfway point, And that's really important. We'll spend some time talking about this, the structure of the Sermon on the Mount to see why that's important next week. So, uh, so you won't want to miss that. But uh, at the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the section that we just went through, um, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 7 through 48, we got Jesus' new view of Scripture. It's not really new. It's, it's what God has always intended, but, but Jesus showed us six different uh, passages of scripture and how we ought to interpret them and how we ought to live that. Uh, and then that section ended in verse 48 with, with the phrase, um, but you be perfect even as your heavenly father is perfect. And remember, as we connected that word perfect with its, in, in, with its meaning throughout the New Testament and in the Old Testament, we found it as more completeness or wholeness. So, so be whole even as your heavenly father is whole and we're going to find out a little bit more about what that means starting this week and this week and as we begin looking in uh, Matthew chapter 6 verses 1 through 34 we're going to get a view 
Now, a new view of spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices. And whenever I say the word practice or disciplines, we chafe against that. Uh, but believe me, you have all kinds of disciplines in your life. You have all kinds of practices in your life. Um, but these are ones that point us to God. Okay, so we're going to start with that. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. And here's what it says. It says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. Okay, there's a couple of things in that simple a uh, couple of, of sentences there that, that we just need to check out, all right? Uh, some key words here. Uh, first of all, practice your righteousness. Practice your righteousness. That's a strange phrase to us. First of all, we don't use righteous very much in our daily language. And, and really practice, uh, we, we, we think we know what that is because we've all, like we said earlier, had to practice sports or we had to practice a musical lesson or or maybe you're in the middle of something some of that even uh, some of uh, our jobs the the very doing of some of our jobs is, is called a practice and so uh, what are we talking about here well this is a an important phrase practice your righteousness it, it's a phrase that all good Israelites all good Jews in the first century would have understood and uh, that word righteousness can mean several different things in scripture it can be God's righteousness uh, it can be um, our righteousness or it can be these practices these activities uh, and there were several that were marked out as those that good righteous people would do practice your righteousness and these are habits that are in harmony with a couple of different things. They're habits that are in harmony, first of all, with a right relationship with God. Whenever we talk about righteousness and the Bible, God is the standard of good. All of us would have some kind of standard of what makes a good person or what makes a, a bad person. And, and that kind of shifts from person to person, doesn't it? It shifts uh, depending on where you're coming from politically. It shifts on whether, where you're coming from geographically in our, our nation. Um, uh, that kind of thing shifts according to our opinion. And sometimes we want to we say, well, I think I understand what righteousness is, but God is always the standard of righteousness when we're talking about Scripture and when we're talking about spiritual things. You don't get to choose what you think is righteous and what you think is unrighteous because this is a standard that is set by God. Is, is that kind of clear uh, on that? So, so this righteousness, and there might be some things in this righteousness that depending on where you come from morally, that you might think <laughs> that's immoral in my book, but it is God's standard. It is God's righteousness. And, and so we're, we're going by that. So it, it is a practice, a habit Something that we do that is in harmony with God's, uh, with a right relationship with God. And second of all, to those first century Jews, it would have meant um, also practices that are in harmony with a right relationship with other people, especially those in need. In the Old Testament, you will read um, uh, Job was a righteous person. Or other people were righteous people. And that wasn't just an estimation of their behavior or something like that. Yeah, I think he's a pretty good guy. That was a specific statement that they checked all the, the boxes when it came to standards of practice that helped, them, uh, helped people to know that they were not only a God-fearer or God-worshipper, but they also followed carefully His laws. And there were several key practices. Now, this is important in the first century especially because uh, Israel was not in a favored position in society. They were under the oppression of Rome. Rome was, was 
was uh, ruling over them and, and taxing them heavily. They were not an independent company, uh, country at that time. In fact, their king, the, the Jewish king, had been selected by the government of Rome and, and uh, was, was in place. And so they basically were in service to Rome. And spiritually, they were having a hard time reconciling with that. And they thought for sure this meant that certain people and that a group of people somewhere in, in our society aren't being righteous. They aren't practicing righteousness. And so there were groups like the Pharisees, a very public pressure group that would look around and make sure and catch people who were not doing righteousness, who were not practicing righteousness. So these were things, specific things, we'll talk about some of them, what they are, uh, and, and nobody in our culture is looking over anybody's shoulder to see what their behavior is like, right? So we, we have a little bit of trouble understanding this, right? right? I mean, you don't go to, you know, if you're in elementary school, go to school and people are criticizing how you behave. And you, you don't graduate from that and go to like middle school or junior high school and then people criticize how you behave or what you wear or things like that. And then you don't, you know, you graduate from that and go into high school and people criticize your behavior and what you wear and what you look like and things like that. And then as an adult, especially as an adult, n no one criticizes your behavior or what you say or what you wear or anything, do they? Yeah, we, so we don't understand this at all. We don't understand pressure groups in our society at all, do we? Do we know? So we wouldn't understand what the Pharisees were like. They were a pressure group who was intended, and their intent was good, to make people righteous so that God would see our righteousness and set things right. That was, that was their thinking. That was, that's good thinking, right? That if the people in our nation were behaving correctly and honoring God with their behavior, then God would bless their nation. That was their thinking. And so, practices were really important. And Jesus is going to mention three. These are not all the practices, just like the six uh, passages of Scripture that Jesus wanted us to look at are not all, all, all the ways we need to interpret Scripture a little bit differently than, than usual. Uh, he's saying this is a new way of looking at, at Scripture, just like these are examples of a new way of looking at spiritual discipline or spiritual practice, acts of righteousness. He mentions three. One is almsgiving or giving to the poor. The second one is prayer. And the third one is fasting. Uh, we would probably choose some different ones in our day and age uh, as, as kind of cornerstone ones in our society. But we would also include those things, those three things, in, uh, in, in our list. of If we made a huge list of all the possible spiritual practices and things like that. But these are, are a sample and really cornerstone ones. And I'm going to say that if these aren't part of your spiritual practice, they, they probably need to be. You need to explore these because Jesus mentions them for a reason. However, that's not the sole list of spiritual practices that he's talking about. And so, um, and what these practices do, just like practicing uh, some, uh, uh, an instrument or practicing in sports, what they do is that the more that we do these things, they transform us. They change us. It's like training for the kingdom life. But Jesus is going to give us a warning. He's going to say there's even a way to practice these things which will not lead to good stuff. So let's, let's just have that hanging out there. And he says one of the things that sets us apart or one of the things that you don't want to mix in with practice is is to do it in front of others to be seen by them. There's a motive here. Uh, the word to be seen by them is one word. It's theaomai. It's where we get the word theater. Where we get the word theater. It's not a bad word. It's just, it's just can, you, can you see, that's going to that's gonna tie into some other words 
uh, that, that are also connected with, with the theater. In a theater, when someone does something, the expectation is applause. The expectation is that other people will notice. It is for the entertainment or, or for some purpose for a crowd of people to notice this, okay? So be careful not to do it in front of others to be seen by them. Theaomai, where we get our word for theater. Now, I just want to remind us, and somebody asked about this early, early on, as they were reading all the way through the Sermon on the Mount, they noticed uh, that this is in conflict with another statement that Jesus talked about. And it is a statement um, that is in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. If you have your Bible, why, why don't you go there real quick? It's just a real quick verse. Um, but but uh, I'll, I'll read it here. It says, There Jesus said, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So in Matthew chapter 5, 16, Jesus is saying, Hey, there's some things I'm going to teach you to do, and I want you to do them so that other people see them and glorify God. So, when Jesus is talking here, is Jesus contradicting himself? And I'm going to say no. No. What Jesus is doing is he is saying there is a motive for the way that we do things that needs to be considered. Remember, let me read Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what's the purpose? So that God is glorified. That we do good in a way that glorifies God. Remember, He's the standard for righteousness. And we do those things to glorify God. Here, what Jesus is talking about, uh, he's, he's targeting those who are doing good deeds in order to get the praise of other people. And again, why would they want the praise of other people? Because there are these gatekeepers out there who are watching who just know that those who are not doing righteous practices are holding the country back, are keeping us from being faithful to God. And so they're going to point it out. And it's very important because pressure groups can do just that. They can apply pressure. They can make it rough on your kids. They can make it rough on your family. They can make it rough at work and things like that. And nobody wants that kind of hassle. And so... Jesus is warning in a culture like that, that there are some reasons for doing even good things that can turn them into not so good things. And he says, as a result of that, if you're doing them as though it's theater, you will have no reward from your father in heaven. <laughs> Hang on. I do everything I do for very altruistic reasons. No reward needed, right? Well, we'll talk about that a little bit later because this has a lot to do with what Jesus is talking about. He's going to make this statement a couple of different times that God rewards what is done in secret, okay? And again, remember, the secret isn't about um, only doing good when other people can't see it. It's about doing good for, a right, for the right motive, all right? We're not doing good for the crowd to see it. We're doing good to glorify God, all right? So there's, there's a motive thing in there. All right, so he's going to get into this practice, okay? Chapter 6, verse 2 says, So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, which, hey, did you bring your trumpet today? <laughs> None of us brought a trumpet for offering time, right? Uh, we, we, we didn't do that. This is not a literal thing where anyone, you know, you know had a trumpet and, and they would give. Uh, it's kind of the same phrase as you toot your own horn. Did anybody's grandma or grandpa ever say that? I just said that, which I'm a grandpa. So I guess it's right for me to say that. Uh, anyway, I, I want you to notice something here. So... When you give to the needy, 
What is Jesus' assumption? Jesus' assumption is that we will give to the needy. It's, re it's really important that we know this. So here's the practice that he's talking about. And, and you may, and if you're using King James or something like that, that word may be in your almsgiving. I think that's a pretty good translation, actually. Because it's odd enough, it helps us to understand um, that, that this is giving with a, with a specific purpose, okay? Now, let me just talk to you a little bit about how almsgiving or giving to the needy was done in the first century. It, it was actually, uh, the synagogue was the center of all compassionate ministry. If you had a need for something, you went to the synagogue. They were in a culture where the government didn't give much of a safety net or anything. And the only safety net was the synagogue. And so uh, if you needed food, you would go to the synagogue. If you, if you needed financial help, you would go to the synagogue. And there were processes for that. And, and so people gave to the synagogue so that that money could then be dispersed to other people. And um, there were rules about how much you could give because some people were so generous in that way that uh, the synagogue had too much money and they were afraid of creating people with dependencies on, on that money. And so, so there was a cap to how much you could give, but there was also an expectation that you would give a certain amount to that. And similarly... Uh, whenever you tithe or give to our church, a percentage of that goes into uh, missions, a percentage of that goes towards uh, uh, helping us do what we do here in the building. Uh, some of that goes to local ministries, and, and, and uh, part of that is that some of that money as well goes to a fund that is called our benevolence fund. It's, it, it's what we uh, give to those who are in dire need. I mean, we this has to happen now or you know, kind of situation. And so very, very similarly, it, it operates that way. But Jesus' assumption is that we will give to the needy. His followers will give to the needy. But he says, do it without fanfare. Do it without announcing to the crowd. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. How many of you were hoping you would hear about hypocrites today because you're at church, right? That's one of the most commonly associated uh, words with church, um, as though there are no hypocrites in the doctor's office. By the way, my doctor told me some months ago that I should lose some weight. And I was holding my tongue, tapping on the table, noting that he probably weighed a whole lot more than I did. Just saying, just saying, but hypocrites are only in one place here, okay? And so, uh, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets. And again, nobody was going around with a trumpet, you know, throwing money in the offering plate or anything like that. What they were doing is they, they were making sure the right people saw that they gave. Because you want the right reputation. Because you don't want a pressure group on you. All right? So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Let's look at this word hypocrite. Because to us, in our culture, here's what the word hypocrite means. Someone who says something and then does the opposite. In our culture, that's what it means. So a hypocrite in, in, in this uh, instance would be someone who said, you should give, everyone here should give to the needy, who then is a person who does not give to the needy. Right? Would you agree that's what that means in our culture? Or someone who says, you know, I think upright living means that you, that you don't drink, that you don't drink alcohol and you don't get drunk. But then that person, uh, you know, comes stumbling out of the bar later in the week, you know, uh, with two, two in his hands, right? And, and so uh, we would say hypocrite. 
And I want you to know that the word hypocrite was, was not a pejorative term, but it didn't mean that. Let, let's find out what it means because it's connected to our word theomai. Uh, theomai. Uh, anyway, um, hypocrite or um, uh, hypocrites is the Greek word, meant an actor on a stage. An actor on a stage. It was a common term for actors. What does an actor do? He acts like somebody else. And what it, why does an actor do that? The actor does that for the applause and the entertainment of the audience. So Jesus is talking about someone who is playing a role. Now, for someone who says one thing but does the other, Jesus would not approve of that either. That's not a good thing. Um, J Jesus would also have a hard time with that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is talking about is someone who does the thing but does it for the wrong reason. All right? Now listen. Um... People are really weird about the way they apply scripture sometimes. Because I made that statement, one of you or two of you or 12 of you are thinking, oh, so if Jesus doesn't want us to do things for the wrong reason, then maybe it's better if I don't do good things. You see how our brains work? I don't get it. That's not what Jesus is saying. Remember, what Jesus is saying is that you're going to give to the needy. But that's a really important practice. But I want you to do it in a certain way that will transform you while you're doing it. Because these things I'm calling you to do in this world are really hard for you to do in this world unless some things get transformed in you and you need some practice in order to do that. The hypocrites were playing a role because almsgiving was culturally expected and they wanted the approval of the cultural gatekeepers. Were they giving out of concern for the poor? No. The reason why they were giving was so that the pressure group doesn't make it hard on them later. So the pressure group doesn't make it difficult on their lives. They had very different motives. They didn't know anybody that was poor. They didn't care about anybody that was poor. All they knew was that they didn't want all the hassle that would be coming on them when somebody, and you know who you are, found out I wasn't giving everything that they thought I should give. Okay? And so they were giving it for the approval of other people. Now listen, the other weird way that we're going to apply this is that some of you are going to think, <laughs> you see, I'm above all that. Because I really don't care what anybody thinks. Can I just tell you that if, you're, if that's you, that's a really unhealthy way to live. That's abnormal. That's psychotic. If you don't care, if you don't care one whit what anybody else thinks, that's not what Jesus is, is talking about here. If you, in order to love other people, you have to care about them. You have to care a little bit about what they think. To empathize with someone, you have to care a little bit. But what Jesus is saying is that that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is glory to God. Glory to God. Now, for those of you that are really proud about thinking, I don't really care what anyone thinks. How's that working in your family? How's that working in your love relationships, your marriage? I'm just going to get up and I don't care. I ain't going to do those dishes, make that bed. I ain't going to help with the laundry. I'm not doing anything because I don't give a flip what anybody thinks. Psychotic. That's what that is. All right. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, 
For the people that are doing it for the crowd, guess what? I tell you the truth that when somebody notices them and says, there you go, mark the Longleys off on the list this week they gave, all right. So if the nation falls apart, it's not your fault this week, all right? You've received your reward if that's all you're doing it for. If, you're, if your reward is for somebody to go, hey, hey, that's kind of nice. By all means, Jesus says, well, do it for that reason. However, that's all you're getting out of that. That's all you're getting out of that. The acclaim of the crowd was the reward that they were seeking. And then we get to a really weird phrase here. And we think we know what it means again, but it will sound very different to us, clearly very different to us than it would sound to a first century Jew. And it is this statement here. And this is what makes us interpret all of this in, in weird ways. Um, uh, I'm sorry. And it's this um, verses three through four. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you're giving may be in secret. All right. One of the weird ways that we interpret this is that I, I know all kinds of folks who go, man, I'll give to the church, but it's going to be in cash because I don't want anyone to have a record of what I've given because of this verse. That's not what this verse is talking about. And this is a weird way of saying something, right? How can my right hand not know what my left hand is doing and things like that. Well, let's go back to the word practice. One of the things that fascinates me, my best friend growing up was a drummer and, and now Noah is, is practicing drums and, and playing for us and I'm fascinated by it. Have you ever watched a drummer? All right. They will be holding the beat with this foot, different beat with this foot, Try it. Doing something different with this hand. And something different with this hand. I can't sing and clap at the same time. All right. It's, it's just really hard for me. I, I can do one or the other, but I cannot do both. Anybody with me on that? Hey, just say amen. Yeah, say amen. And, 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 uh, uh, and that kind of thing. Here's, here's what the drummer has done. Is that over years and years and years of practice, when, when I asked my friend Matt Bradford, how do you do that? He goes, I don't even think about it. I don't have to think about it. And I said, how many times do you have to practice a song anymore? And he goes, if I run through it once or twice, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I could probably perform that way. To be really good, I'd have to spend, you know, half a day practicing or something like that to, to catch the rhythms and catch the subtleties of it. But I no longer have to think about what I'm doing. Because he's practiced so much that he no longer has to go, okay, now I have to tap my foot. Now I have to hit the symbol. Now the rest of us have done this as well. How many of you remember how complex it was the first time you tried to drive an automobile? You don't remember that right now. Some of you are going, I was born on a farm. I could drive before I was born. You know, that kind of thing. You don't count right at this moment, okay? It's, it's for the rest of us. The rest of us that remember going, oh my goodness, I'm in the car. Now I have to put my foot on the brake and turn on the key. And then I have to look in the mirror and I have to change the, the gear. And then I have to back out and hope I don't run over anybody and all that. And even turning, even turning complex thing, isn't it? Now, you don't remember this because, because you've been doing it so long, you don't have to think about it. Remember, when you are turning, you have to check in your mirror to make sure some, you know, idiot's not coming up alongside you, uh, trying to cut through traffic and that kind of thing. You have to turn on the blinker while you're turning. You have to put on the get on the brake at the right time. And then you have to let off the brake at the right time and put on the gas at the right time. You have to be looking both ways. It's a complex thing. And I just love it, what, I've said it before, but what my niece said to, um, to my brother-in-law, he noticed she was playing with the blinker after she turned, and he goes, honey, honey, it turns off by itself. She goes, oh, good. That's one less thing I have to worry about. Right? But you know what? 
on my way here, I successfully made several turns without having, having to think about, when do I put my blinker on? When do I put my, my foot on the brake, right? Anybody else like that? It was almost like my left hand didn't have to know what my right hand was doing. It was almost like I had practiced this before. And so every part of me, my foot, my eyes, my hands, knew what I should be doing. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. I want you to give in a way that glorifies God. And when you're giving towards the poor, you should be concerned for the poor while you're doing it. But I want you to give in such a way that it's a practice that you don't have to deliberate about it every single time. Where you go, oh, this is just so hard. And he says, at first it will be. At first it'll be awkward. At first it'll be difficult. But the more that you practice it, the more that you do it. And of course, he says, you're going to be doing it. The more you will give. Um, Dallas Willard helps us on this point. He says, the kind of people who've been so transformed by their daily walk with God that good deeds naturally flow from their character are precisely the kind of people whose left hand would not notice what their right hand is doing. As, for example, when driving one, one's own car or speaking in one's own native language, what they do, they do naturally, often automatically, simply because of what they of what they are, pervasively and internally. These are people who do not have to invest a lot of reflection in doing good for others. Their deeds are in secret, no matter who's watching. For they are absorbed in love of God and of those around them. They hardly even notice their own deed and rarely remember it. This is someone who's doing these practices and over time the practice changes them. And at first it's awkward and you have to think, okay, this hurts because I'm giving and it's my income. But someone else needs it. And the more that you give, the more you remind yourself, this is to the glory of God and the good of others. This is the glory of God and the good of others. The glory of God and good of others. And guess what? Over time, as you do that, you'll find yourself giving a little more freely and a little more freely. It is a practice that changes you. Like practicing the drums, pretty soon you no longer even have to think about it. It's what I do. See, when a practice becomes reflexive, a person no longer needs to think about it. They just do it. Now, let me just ask you a quick question. Why is it so hard to do and live the way Jesus calls us to live? But we're not just talking about this. I'm talking about everything that we've learned so far. Remember, Jesus says, it's not good enough for my followers to not just be, not be murderers. All right. Remember, we we need to be the kind of people who don't get so angry that we dehumanize others and call them names and things like that. Why is that so hard? It has everything to do with this. Well, the first reason, um, and 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 why spiritual disciplines? Well, the two go together. The first reason it's so hard and the first reason why we need spiritual disciplines is that we've been broken by sin and discipled by our culture. Broken by sin and discipled by our culture. Do you realize that our culture has its own spiritual practices that have transformed you? Do you know gossip is a practice? And the more you gossip, the more you talk about someone, the more you feel a, way, a certain way about them. It's a practice that transforms you on the inside. 
It's one of the great practices Satan loves to use. Do you realize um, that uh, being self-centered is a practice? Spending all your money on yourself is a practice? It's a practice that is acceptable in our culture, and it transforms you. It cements a certain kind of behavior in you. It makes you more and more a certain way. Do you realize complaining is a spiritual practice? It's not a good spiritual practice. The more you complain, the more it's everyone else's fault and the less responsibility you have. And when you're complaining, you're practicing something that is transforming you and shaping you. Why do we need these spiritual practices? Because Jesus is saying, because I'm trying to form the kind of people who believe it's not enough to be the kind of person who just doesn't shoot people randomly on the street. My followers need to be transformed into the kind of people who never dehumanize other people, who never see them as objects and body parts that we lust after and never go back on our word or make our words so complex that others can't follow them and things like that. Jesus says, I'm transforming you into the kind of people who can be obedient, who can be whole, even as the Lord their God is whole. And he says it takes practice because sometimes it's going to feel like I'm tapping out one beat with this foot and a different one with this foot and a different one with this hand and a different one with this hand and it's going to feel so awkward. And Jesus says, keep doing it until it feels natural. But also, disciplines help us practice a new way of living. The more we spend time in giving to those in desperate need, in prayer to our Holy Heavenly Father, perhaps denying ourselves in fasting, the more we practice these things, the more we get into a rhythm where it's not about us, it's about doing good for others and the glory of God, doing good for others to the glory of God, doing good for others to the glory of God. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? So is Jesus, this is a little bit weird for us because probably in our culture, Jesus would have to address, well, well yes, you do need to do these things. And he'll address this later. But what he is saying is to a culture that is doing it because others are putting pressure on them to do things, that's the wrong reason to do all these things. You need a practice that turns you into a people that does good for the glory of God. Does good for the glory of God. Um, and then disciplines target our fear of what others think of us. You know what? We do things. Because of what others think, don't we? We do fear what others think. When you begin fearing what everybody else thinks, that's when you start to have a problem. That's a different kind of psychosis than not worrying about what anybody thinks. That's the, one kind can't really live with other people because they don't care about other people. One kind can't, and the other kind can't really live with other people because they care way too much about other people. Where God is very small and people are very big in their lives. Where you do things because of the expectations of everyone around you. And, and there, there's not much that you can do out of your own free will or out of your own desire or out of your own love for God. You're just doing things because everyone else is telling you this is what you ought to be doing. And Jesus says that's not healthy either. 
It's not healthy either. Do good for the glory of God. Do good for the glory of God. And he adds this little piece. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Are we talking like money? Free movie tickets? A crown, a jewel in my crown at heaven? He doesn't really answer that here. But here's what I think. Here's what I think. When we begin doing things for the glory of God, we've invited God into those things. Um, but when we practice marriage the way God intended marriage to be practiced, we're inviting God into the process. When, when we do money the way God intended us to do money, we're inviting God into the process. When, we, when we're doing it just our way, stubbornly, what we're saying to God is, um, you know, thanks for the offer of help, but no thanks, I got this. I just want to cry out to you when there's an emergency. And here's what, here's what God is, is saying on this. Listen, if you want to give to get an award, if you want to give so that other people think you're great, that's, that's wonderful, fine. Thank you for giving. But that's the only reward you will get. But if you will begin to give and do good for my glory, I'll be with you in the midst of that. And you will begin to see over time, not only that your habits are different, but your heart is different because my Holy Spirit has been working powerfully through you to transform you into the person I always knew you should be, in fact, created you for this very purpose. God is going to reward us with his very presence. And we will begin to see that God is our reward. It's beautiful. I think Jesus knows what he's doing. <laughs> I, th I think he's worth following. And you know what? We're so worried these days that anything that we do will turn into legalism. Jesus doesn't seem to be real concerned about that. He, he, he wants us to do good. In fact, he, it's just his assumption. If you're following me, you're going to take care of the needs of the poor. It's gonna, you're going to find a way to do that. I know you because you're following me. But unfortunately, if you're doing those things and you're doing them not for my glory, you'll find ways to mess it up. you'll do it for my glory I'll do things through you that you did not know were possible you've invited me into something and you're about to set me loose in a field in an area of your life that will make a huge difference in your life in your family's life in your work life in everything that you do if you'll do these things to my glory I'll do things through you that are good So what about it? You up for a little practice? <laughs> you up for a little practice? It's awkward at first. Sure feels really strange because you've got you've you've got to turn the turn signal and the wheel and put your foot on the brake and look both ways and look in the mirrors all at the same time and it feels awkward at first. But a few bad turns, a few weird giving mishaps, being taken a time or two, it's clumsy at first. And then you'll get in the rhythm. You'll get in the rhythm. And you won't even have to think about it. And somebody will tap you on the shoulder someday and go, did you just really drop that for them? I, I guess I did. I guess I did, but it's to the glory of God. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, 
I wish I could say that if you'll do this, all our dreams will come true. That's, that's not what you're talking about. That's not the good that you're talking about. That's not the, the reward that you're talking about. I believe what you're talking about is that we will grow more and more to love the practices that we do because they give you glory. And Lord, if these things give you glory, then I want to do them for your glory. You're all about, Jesus was all about love for you and love for others. May we be creative in the ways that we do that, but may we be steady and practiced in the way that we do it so that we do it with whole hearts, pure hearts, hearts turned towards you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you would put the uh, giving slide up there, please. Uh, there's many ways that uh, we, you can give. Uh, I've already talked about my favorite way of giving. Um, but uh, now when these, uh, these uh, five and six figure uh, ties come in, uh, Pastor, we might need a new uh, box out there to, to handle those. So. But anyway, uh, if you would please stand.